Hey, we always like hearing that music on a Wednesday afternoon because that signifies helping Seniors of Brevard is ready to get underway for this Wednesday. I'm John Harper. Let's introduce the host of Helping Seniors of Brevard and the executive director of the organization as well. Here's none other than Carrie Fink. Hi, Carrie. Hey, John Harper. Thank you for the kind introduction and welcome as we get on the radio every Wednesday lunchtime, 12 noon to 1 p.m. right here on 90.3 FM WEJF. And if you're listening online at wejf.net thank you for tuning in and also if you join us by podcast we welcome you in we're available wherever you get a podcast spotify iheart radio itunes you name it we're there and uh our mission uh as extended by our founder he's now president emeritus uh joe steckler he's the guy that put together the brevard alzheimer's foundation and all of that you know, but he's always said we're here to inform, educate, and connect seniors to resources that are going to make a difference. We call it senior navigation. And now, uh, on behalf of our president, uh, uh, we we love the fact that Jennifer Barton is now our president. It took our entire board like one tenth of one second to say that Jennifer is the right person. When Joe said, "You young whippersnappers got to pick up this up and run with it," and I want to say this about Joe also. Uh, because we were talking through, so Joe is still very much on the board. He's uh, he's going to write the articles and things. It's just more of the day-to-day stuff as we're trying to do all the work for seniors. Joe is 90, going on 91. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, Joe has been helping seniors in our county since the mid-90s. And somebody that knows Joe even better than I do because he was helping Joe when Joe was getting Brevard Alzheimer's going is our guest today. It's none other than board-certified elder law attorney, Bill Johnson. Hey, Bill, how are you? Good. Good afternoon, Kerry. You have known you have you have known and helped Joe with all of all of this senior stuff, like going way, 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 way back. Yeah, at least back to the Alzheimer's Foundation. And I, I remember literally when I first met you, Joe, of course, was doing the TV and radio shows in those days. And I, I was thinking to myself at that time, I really didn't know much or even have much exposure to the thoughts about things of elder care. I met him because, you know, it's my background as a media guy. And he said, you know, Carrie, I need some help getting, um, you know, I want to do the radio and TV and those kind of things for helping seniors like I used to do with before Alzheimer's. So I remember you and Joe doing some of the early TV shows and I was thinking like, wow, there's a lot here that I need to learn about. And uh, each time I sit down with you, I keep learning more. And I was I was thinking, we were trading emails. I said, well, what's the topic we should cover today? And I was I was thinking when you wrote back, I was smiling. I said, there's two things inevitable in life. And everybody else jokes, it's death and taxes, right? But I guess another thing that would otherwise be inevitable in life if you didn't do things right would be probate. <laughs> but you can avoid probate. You can avoid probate. Correct. And so, so we, thought, we thought, well, let's talk about that today uh, because, you know, um, we've said this for a lot, large part of the time. You know, what we do in helping seniors is what we call senior navigation. People call us on our helpline, and they've got questions about everything, housing, legal, medical, financial, transportation, all these different areas. And there was an expression that Nancy Deardorff came up with a long time back, and she said, you know, how do you know what you don't know? And the more I talk with Bill, the more I realize that what you don't know can also hurt you a lot, you know, because – I see us try to be very careful to pinch pennies and we're trying to like, let's use a coupon for that. Or maybe I can save $20 over here if I, if I do this thing this way. And so we do a good job with stuff like that, but we miss something huge, like what we would call estate planning. But I guess maybe many of us do it because a, we don't want to consider it. Maybe we just don't want to think about the topic or maybe we don't think we're important enough or big time enough to be needing quote an estate plan. I don't know. Why do we not plan early enough, Bill? <laughs> right. I, I know attorneys who, for their kids, have them do all this stuff as soon as they turn 18. You know, I was thinking about that because Jennifer Barton, you know, when they, her company is Seniors Helping Seniors. So they hire seniors to go in and, and help seniors at home. And I remember one of the things that um, when we were having this conversation before, she goes in and she goes, we just ask the family when we sit down and we do an initial 
like an intake and we want to know what we're what we're, how we're going to try to help she said i was asked do you guys have you know like your medical paperwork like that and she says usually i see the kids sitting on the couch saying yeah mom you need to get your paperwork done and she'll turn back to them and say yeah but what about your paperwork you know bill you have seen like the good the bad the ugly on this and it's got to be so 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 unstressful when people have done their planning the right way Correct. Uh, it makes it a lot easier, especially when, you know, when we're talking about probate, it means somebody's passed away. Yeah. So that is probably a very stressful time for the family. And, you know, if things go very smoothly, it makes it all that much better for them. Yeah. And so I, I want to kind of dive into the conversation because I don't want to assume uh, I, I want to take myself. Not that I think I'm any kind of an expert because I learn every time I sit with you. But 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 I do want to kind of go back to that first time you did a tv show with joe and by the way all these tv shows if you're curious you can find them they're on the uh, helping seniors youtube channel you can go back and find them on our facebook page you can uh, uh check them out at helping seniors of brevard.org we, we archive and library and everything but but i remember that first i guess we start with a question what is probate you know yeah probate uh well the word derives from uh the latin meaning to prove and what are we proving we're proving the will is valid so probate is the process where we file your will with the court system if you don't have a will it we can we have a statute called an intestate statute that determines who gets what but you file the will, and then if everything's in order, the judge will enter an order admitting the will to probate and then issue something called letters of administration to your nominated personal representative. And once they get that, they are the personal representative, which is Florida's word for executor, and then they take over the management of the estate. They have to file an inventory, what what are the assets that are passing through probate? They also have to file a notice to creditors that runs in a paper for two consecutive Thursdays, and that gives creditors roughly three months to show up and file claims. And they muster the assets, and then when the, all the claim period's over, if there are claims, you either object to them or you can pay them. And then whatever's left over after the cost of doing the probate uh, gets distributed to whoever the heirs are. So I know you and I have joked about this line before. You say, you know, uh, if you don't make a plan for your life or even even after you've gone on to the great, you know, to your great reward, I guess the question is, if you don't have a plan, the government has a plan. And, and Correct. I don't know about you. All I think about is my experience standing in line at DMV or things like that. Whenever government gets involved in stuff, there's always a question about, like, how smoothly is all this going to be? Or, you know, all, do I have all the right paperwork? It just seems complicated. And I guess that's probate? Well, it can get really complicated if you consider that of people over 65, 50% of them live in extended families. Oh. So they've you know, been divorced or the spouse has died and they've been remarried. So now they have a new spouse and kids from a prior uh, marriage. And, and so then you have to really, <laughs> the plan that the state comes up with may not be the plan you want. You know, I was going to ask you about that because I was thinking like, you know, I, I remember it was pretty, uh, pretty famous story. I don't even know how it turned out, but Aretha Franklin passed away, you know, the queen of soul and all that. And I remember all these relatives coming out of the woodwork and somebody, quote, finds a will behind a sofa or something. I don't, you know, how does all that work? <laughs> well, yeah, it can get crazy. Uh Basically, the last will is the will where we start with. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as that gets admitted and it doesn't get tossed out, then that's the one we use. Yeah. So uh, it's not unusual for people to do several wills during the course of their life. You know, as kids get born, um, you know, and spouses die, uh, sometimes there's uh, a lot of things we have to change in the existing will. You know, and that's another question, right? Because as life goes along, it tends, it can often tend to get a little messier, you know, it, 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 because like you're talking about, you know, I guess we were first introduced to it with like the Brady Bunch, these blended families, but now I guess by, and also we're living longer, right? So 
by the time somebody shows up and we got to do this will, maybe they've had three marriages or something and there's kids on all sides and maybe what was done 20, 30 years ago might not reflect what's supposed to happen. All that's part of that whole probate process, right? Correct. Correct. So you, as an elder law attorney, how do you sort that out? The family comes in and says, you know, uncle so-and-so just passed away. He said he wanted me to be the executor. I don't know what that means. What do I do? <laughs> well, uh, we want to see the will. Yeah. <laughs> we need the original <laughs> will. And we have to file the original will with the court system. Um, we also need a death certificate to prove that they, they've passed. And then we attach those to the petition and file it with the court. And yep. it's generally called a petition for administration. But I guess this could be really complicated because here, particularly in Florida, right, we have a lot of snowbirds. Like, well, I live part of the time in Michigan and I come down here and then nobody knows where these papers are. They don't know how to do all this stuff. It really seems like it could get messy real quick. It can, especially if they haven't done any planning and have houses in two states. Um, you end up probating in each state where real property is located. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and I just I remember a little bit about this, but probate is not free, is it? It is not. That's, uh, you know, one of the things we, we need to talk about is why you want to avoid probate. Right. <laughs> uh, typically, here in Brevard County, they run 9 to 12 months. Wow. So it takes a while. Yep. Um, your executor, the person you've put in, in charge, can charge 3% of the value of the assets passing through probate. The attorney can charge typically 3% of the first million, then 2.5 of the next million, 2 of the next million. Uh, so it can be very expensive. So on a million-dollar probate, our fee would be $30,000. Whoa. <laughs> which, which, again, is all voluntary. You, if right. you know how to avoid probate, you don't have to pay any of that. Well, I, we talked about this once before because I was thinking about, like, you know, you maybe don't think you live in the the lifestyle of rich and famous, but you have a house and it might be worth $300,000 by itself and maybe it's mostly paid off and then mm -hmm. you – might have, I don't know, whatever is a 401k. So it doesn't seem unusual that somebody might have half a million or a million dollars, even just us regular people, right? And and so what you're talking about, if it was a if it was like a million dollar estate, you said how much goes how much goes to the person who who the executor? Yeah, three uh, percent. So there's thirty thousand to you, and then there's thirty thousand going to whoever that person is that's doing right. that function, and there must be some court costs and stuff in there as well. Correct. So you just lost a good chunk, good chunk out of there. And I can see maybe the other relatives going like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that probably sets up to cost even more because then people start saying, wait, that's my money. I should mention that the attorney's fees are negotiable. Okay. So like if we have somebody come in and they have one account with 500,000 in it. Right. Okay. And we're probating just one asset. Yeah. Usually we'll drop our fee down. Okay. Okay. Because uh, it's simple. Right. Um, it doesn't require a lot of work. But well, just like you and I have done shows where we've talked about you know topics of one of the reasons you want to get your your medical papers and and powers of attorney and things like that straight is because you don't want to have to necessarily look at guardianship because and you know again anytime typically you get courts involved it's going to slow things down. You're going to have to figure out when court dates are. Is this going to be approved? Is there a problem? Somebody else is going to say there's a problem. This is why you want to avoid probate, right? It's the yeah. cost and the time and the aggravation. You want to avoid the G word and the P word. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, so, so, so let's assume that we spent enough time talking about convincing ourselves that we need to take a plan so we don't have to go through this. Before we get too deep in this, I just want, is there ever a chance you do want probate? I mean, is there is there a time when it might, I, it's, I can't think, but I don't know. Is there a time it's beneficial? Uh, sometimes. If we have a lot of creditors, uh, it helps organize all that. Okay. And then um, we we can pay off the creditors or challenge the ones. So there, there and you have to do an inventory and right. an accounting. So there is uh, some... Uh, you're, you're being held to having to do those things ah. where on some other ways you may not be, you know, and, and true. 
I think true to that too, is I remember you explaining, because we've had this conversation about how like homestead properties, there's like all these questions you have to know about creditors and things like that when somebody passes. And I guess, you know, Bill, we always have this expression in the helping seniors world. Joe called it making an aging plan. We call it, you know, euphemistically getting your ducks in a row. But one of the reasons, and one of the things we add to that is like, please don't try this on your own because it's terribly technical and it's terribly complicated and you make a misstep particularly at that moment you can't really undo it right it's too late you can't bring them back from the dead and say oh you were supposed to sign this one extra box you know so there are three different ways to avoid probate Uh basically uh one of those is by joint title with rights of survivorship okay so if you have a husband and wife and they own a piece of property, one of them dies, it goes to the survivor. Uh-huh. Um, that's automatic. You have to just record the death certificate. Uh, bank accounts are presumed to get passed to the surviving joint owners of the accounts. Mm-hmm. So the problem is if you're married, you know, one of you dies, then it's in one person's name, and then they die, that's assets going to probate. Unless you've added another name or, or a beneficiary or something to it. Yeah, and then you get into this whole thing. I know that, you know, when you do estate planning, you talk, you have tools that you can use mm-hmm. that make this process work where, like, even if you have property, you put, I, I don't even really know what I'm talking about, but trusts or things like that. There's vehicles that you can use that will make things pass along without having to go through the probate world. Correct. And and number two on my list would be a beneficiary designation. Uh Most of us are very familiar with putting uh, beneficiaries on life insurance, annuities, IRAs, 401ks. If you name an individual, boom, it passes to whoever you named uh, without probate. And, and, And is it true that that's kind of true even regardless of other creditor claims or things? Correct. That so, so true. like, I'm just saying, like, I owe something out here, but I was smart enough to put so and so on the bank account. Then it kind of like just as, right over here. As soon as you die, it belongs to somebody else. So, right there is a pretty strong reason to take a solid look at this. You know, so your credit card company comes back at the end, and what you had hoped to give to your you know, your either your siblings or your 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 children or whoever you had picked out. That's one way to protect yourself on that. Correct, correct. And in Florida, you're not liable for your spouse's debts. Oh, that's interesting. So, like, if everything passed to a surviving spouse without having to go through probate, uh-huh. you know, either joint ownership or beneficiary designations, uh, then, you know, if if the spouse of deceased had $200,000 in hospital bills, the surviving spouse isn't liable for that. Interesting. So, you know, that's here again, we're back to this whole thing. What you don't know could hurt you. And so uh, I'm sure I, I was thinking about how people arrive at your office to have the probate discussion. I mean, obviously, it's pretty simple if they've done their paperwork with you and they call up and say, well, here's what happened you know mom mom is partying with jesus now you know but now we got to straighten this out and you say well we already did everything so it's well organized it's got to bring peace of mind to the family first of all because they're already upset enough and Mm -hmm. now is not the time to add all the extra stress and pressure right (laughs) correct and nowadays you can add beneficiaries to virtually anything you can even add beneficiaries under your house wow through something called a ladybird deed where you you just say when we die the house will pass and when the death certificates get recorded the house automatically passes to whoever you named um that wasn't true when i first started practicing uh you know, you weren't able to put uh, beneficiary designations on, but you can do it on bank accounts. It's called payable on death. On securities, it's called transfer on death. And obviously, you're like I said, the IRAs, 401ks have the beneficiary designation form. And then you can even do it on your house. Yeah. Well, see, I was familiar because, I, you know, when I've gone into a bank and said, okay, I need you to open up a bank account, they've asked that. Do you, you know, what, who do you want, you know, pay on death? So I, I got that, but I didn't know about, or don't guess I really had calculated in about the house. When you say a ladybird deed, 
is that like paperwork that you go file someplace or how? Yeah, that... you have to do a new deed. Uh huh. And basically, you add the whoever you want as beneficiaries to it. Wow. Yep. And then that would keep that whole thing out of uh, probate. Correct. And I know you and I have had discussions because we've had the radio shows before. We've talked about actually the value of the homestead here in Florida, that it has some protections that you may not necessarily get in other states. So it seems like Florida in general is pretty well set up in favor of seniors if you if you do the right steps. Correct, if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and then the third way, of course, is a trust. Mm-hmm. And the way a trust works is you create the trust. You're called the grantor. Mm-hmm. During your lifetime, you are the trustee, which is the manager of the assets in the trust. Mm-hmm. During your lifetime, you're the beneficiary of those mm-hmm. assets. When you pass on, you nominate somebody to be a successor trustee. Okay. And when they put that hat on, they have to follow the instructions in the trust, pay your creditors, and then distribute the assets uh, as the trust tells them to. And because we have that way of putting somebody in charge, mm-hmm. mustering the assets, paying the debts, and then distributing, we don't have to go to court and have ah. the judge put somebody in charge, muster the assets, pay the debts, and distribute. Is so this, that's why assets in a trust avoid probate. Does this give you any... Okay, I'm just thinking outside the box for a second, but suppose like there's a family and okay, they've got a bunch of children. Let's just Let's just say there's three children. Two are responsible, one is got challenges Mm -hmm. and they want to help the one they want to help all the kids equally but they thought if they give the whole lump sum of that one third to that child that has the challenges maybe you know i don't know what issue they're into does a trust let you talk about how they actually access stuff in the trust so one of the benefits of, of doing things by a trust is that under certain circumstances they they really more of an appropriate vehicle than just putting beneficiaries because mm-hmm. when you put somebody as a beneficiary they get that asset lump sum yeah and like if they have a drug problem that right. may not be a good idea that's or, what I was getting at okay something like or that. if they have their spendthrift you know every right. nickel they get so on some of those in a trust you could say hey it, my my kid will get it. Only if, you know, he passes these drug tests yeah. or that uh, we're going to dole the money out over, over time. Yeah, over different ages or different milestones. Okay. Um, also, if you have property in multiple states, you probably want to trust because then you avoid probate in two, in two states. states. Yep. You wow. You put everything in the trust. Well, this is the conversation we're having with board certified elder law attorney Bill Johnson of the law office. William A. Johnson, PA. Um, We're going to take our mid-show break, but Bill, real quick, if somebody has questions, we're going to continue this conversation, but if somebody wants to reach the law office or learn more, how do they get in touch? Uh, They can give us a call at 321-253-1667 or at uh, floridaelderlaw.net. Yeah, we're going to talk about what a great resource that is on the second half of Helping Seniors. See you in a few. And welcome back to the second half of uh, Helping Seniors of Regard. I'm John Harper, and uh, let me reintroduce the host of the show, and that's Kerry Fink. Kerry is also the executive director of Helping Seniors of Regard. And you know, Kerry, one time we tried to uh, change that music, and we got a lot of complaints saying, don't change it. <laughs> Absolutely. People As you, like it. We always laugh whenever we get a new guest in here. Yeah. You know, somebody hadn't been on the radio before because we're always smiling because that music just sends everybody to dancing. Yeah, you know? they dance in their chairs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Even Bill Johnson does. Yeah. Of course, we all do. It's it's we, we called it the music of your life. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so that's what it is. But it's all good. Well, Thank you, John. And uh, we are back for the second half of the Helping Seniors radio show right here on 90.3 FM, WEJF. And if you're listening online at WEJF.net, we appreciate that. And tell your friends. Every Wednesday, noon to one is lunchtime gathering. But listen, we've been having a great conversation with board-certified elder law attorney, Bill Johnson. His law firm is William A. Johnson, PA. He is the author and uh, publisher of... uh, the long, I think it's called Long Term Care Guide, but it's, you put it in the Boomer Guide when the Boomer Guide comes out, and it's a fantastic like primer on all the things we should be concerned with. 
we were talking just before we got into the break. Welcome back, Bill, by the way. Mm-hmm. But we were saying that FloridaElderLaw.net, you, you can get a copy of that right there. Right. You just go on the website and you can download the book. Yeah, because we've been having this conversation thus far, and we're going to continue the conversation, dig a little bit deeper into the trust part of it. But we're talking about why you want to avoid probate. And so one of the reasons we do a podcast with these uh, and we make it available every place, like YouTube, um, also Facebook, also um, you can access it through, actually you can access it through Twitter or X or whatever we call it now. Um, also in LinkedIn, we put we, we try to put it every place people get it. And of course, on our own website, org. And what we've learned, Bill, along the way is people will like tune partway into a radio show. Maybe they came out of a store and got back in their car or something like that. But then they may have missed the first part of the conversation, which was pretty important. So if you're just rejoining us, um, I want to make sure that you know that you can go catch the first part of this conversation, the first half of the show, via podcast or on our website or things like that. Because we are talking about avoiding probate. And part of what we talked about in the first half was why you want to do that. And we're not talking about small dollar reasons to do that. We're talking about big dollar reasons and you've already shared a couple of really good tips about paid on death transfer on death and we talked a little bit about something special called ladybird deed and then we're getting into the conversation about trust which is where i want us to pick up uh so if you missed any of that please make sure you grab the podcast but let's pick up with the conversation about trusts so when we we're talking about trusts, uh, some reasons why you would want to do a trust as opposed to just using beneficiary designations. One is if you had real property in multiple states. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if you have what what we call spendthrift kids, mm-hmm. kids who spend every nickel, so you want to dole it out over time. Right. Also, if you have young kids, you, ah. know, you don't want to necessarily drop a million dollars in the lap of an 18-year-old. So you may want to dole it out over ages or milestones, Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, Special needs kids Mm -hmm. where they're on public benefits, and if they inherit anything, it will knock them off. Ah. So we have to do what we call a special needs trust language Mm -hmm. in the trust uh, so that the assets that are held in trust for them do not count against uh, them for public benefits. So those are some of the reasons you would want to do still do a trust. Sometimes it's also a good tool to get everything organized, too. Mm-hmm. You know, you put all your assets in the trust. Now you know they're all under one roof, so to speak. Um, so when, back, to, back to probate. Mm-hmm. So I said you can avoid probate with beneficiary designations, mm-hmm. uh, joint title with some survivorship rights. Yep. Or putting your assets into trust. Yeah. So what goes through probate? Mm-hmm. Well, it would be any assets you have that don't have a surviving joint owner, don't have a beneficiary, <laughs> right. and are not in a trust. Right. So uh, when we're off the air, me and Carrie are talking about, you know, if you have a, a bank account that's in your name only, no beneficiary, yeah. no joint owner with about $3,000 in it, well, yeah, that would have to go through probate and pass per your will. And the cost of just even opening the probate is like 600 something dollars. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's really annoying when we find these people have these one accounts that they never seem to put a beneficiary on or get in the trust or whatever. Yeah, and I was asking, it was funny because literally he's right, during the break, that's what I was asking him. I said, well, what happens, you know, because I guess maybe economically it's not even worth trying to go get that money at that point. If it's just, you know, a few thousand dollars, it's not going to be worth the time aggravation because by the time you spent to go through the court system, there's not going to be anything to show for it. And so I was asking you, I said, what happens to that money? Right, right. So uh, just to give you like some examples, I've had uh, clients come in. And, you know, they're, they're renting. Uh-huh. Uh, they have a few bank accounts, usually a checking savings and some money invested in CDs. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the perfect person to just do everything with a beneficiary designation. Right. You know, um, you just put beneficiaries on everything. And when they die, you get a stack of death certificates from the funeral home. You go to each institution and you're done. Yeah. 
it, it's very quick. No nine to 12 months of probate, yeah. no paying. You don't even have to go see a lawyer, <laughs> you know, and, and so you can avoid all of that. Now, if I get somebody who's got a little more complicated thing going, you know, like they may have a house here and a, uh-huh. a house up north somewhere, uh, you know, then we're kind of stuck doing a trust. Or if we have, I, I do a lot of work with um, people who are younger people who have moved here and, you know, they have two young kids uh-huh. and I'm like, well, we, we need to do a trust because, if you were to die, you and your husband were to pass, then all your assets would go to your kids. Um, since they're minors, we'd have to have a guardianship set up for them. Oh, wow. Didn't even and then a guardian that. would be in control of that money. But when the kids turn 18, the guardian would have to drop, give them their money. Yeah. And so, you know, we all knew in high school that one kid who got a million dollars and literally within two years it was all gone so that's you know that's when you need a trust to put somebody in charge of their money and if you don't want them to get it 18 you could put different ages or you could say you know they get 25 percent at 18 Mm -hmm. uh if they get a four-year college degree they get another 25 percent yeah you know then uh another 25 percent at 25 and the remainder at 30 so you could set it up like that and, and, you know, put some carrots in there to dangle in front of them. Yeah, and, it's and, a way to put some yeah. control over it, actually. Yep. Yeah. So, what, well, what about this question, then? If somebody, um, you know, I was thinking, we talked in the first half of the show what probate actually could cost. And we were just using, you know, this made-up example of a million dollars. And it, and it may sound like a lot of money to somebody, but if you have a three hundred thousand dollar house, you have a you know a couple hundred thousand in an IRA or something like that, you have you know, it's not implausible that even a regular person is going to have an estate that you know would be half a million to a million dollars. And we were talking about what does that cost to probate, you know, and that could be if it was a million dollars that I think we came up with the number that could be up to 60,000 that goes away because of the attorney's if fees not more. Yeah. and the, uh, the personal representative fees. So let me contrast that by asking you how expensive is a trust to set up? Because I would think like most of us would think a trust is just for rich and famous people. Well, you, what the, the kind of trust we've been talking about is what we call a revocable living trust. Uh-huh. And that means that you set it up while you're alive. That's the living part. Uh-huh. And revocable means you can amend it or change it or okay. even throw it away if you don't wow. like it. So you, you, you may control over it. Uh, then upon your death, it becomes irrevocable, mm-hmm. meaning nobody can change it. And uh-huh. then the, the people you appoint take over. Yeah. So the price range, whew, you you can see them all the way from five hundred to ten thousand. It depends on how complex uh, the estate is. Generally, um, you know, there are people that uh, charge very little to do all that. But yeah. again, I I tend to think you get what you pay for. No, I'm I'm with you on that. But yeah. I was thinking like, so I just want to, I want to draw the comparison because. This is the value of planning ahead, right? We said if you didn't plan ahead, and let's just say you had a million dollar, you know, let's just say it was fairly simple, house, maybe two bank accounts, and these weren't set up right, going through probate, you could lose $70,000, $60,000, $70,000 out of that before anything goes to anybody else. So if we set up a trust, and even if it was five thousand dollars or something, it seems like we or whatever it might be, it would you be just way came ahead. out uh, fifty five thousand ahead. <laughs> just, just for so that's why I keep saying like the the number one lesson I keep learning in this is that the fact that if you would take the time to address these things now, you know we always want to put it off. There's always something more important. We're going to take that next vacation, or we're going to you know repaint the house, or whatever we're going to do, but if we would do this in the long run, sure, the vacation would be fun. Sure, painting the house, you know, is going to make it look a little better. And that might last five more years. But this could be like, we're just talking about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 of savings in the long run. And what if somebody said, well, listen, you know, give me, you know, give me $3,000, $5,000 and I'm going to save you 60000 
Seems like a pretty good investment. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> I just did do the math, right? Yeah, and and again, you know, if we can do, like I said, if we look at what they have as far as assets, and we can do it with beneficiary designations, yeah. it's even cheaper yeah. than that. Yeah. Um, because they just go to the bank and do it at the bank or with their broker. And and the only thing we got to do is prepare a will and, and the deed, the ladybird deed for the house. Well, and that's the point I also wanted to ask you about because, <clears throat> you know, you and I have done whole shows on this where we've talked about, you know, you see that commercial uh, on, on your TV and it says, oh, listen, you can just get on your computer and, you know, click a few buttons <laughs> and you're all set to go <laughs> yeah, until, until you try to use it. There, there, there's an ad I just saw uh, during the football games where it's a guy working on the car with his son. He goes, "When I die, you'll get the son. You know, you'll get this car." And then this guy pops out from underneath the car. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> Not if you haven't done your paperwork. Yeah. You know, and uh, I got a chuckle out of that. But as I've said on the on the air several times, the problem I have with those is a lot of times the people don't follow the instructions. Yeah. You know, it'll say you have to sign this in the presence of two witnesses and a notary and, you know, they'll sign it. And then next day go over to their friend who will witness and then another friend. And then they'll find some notary who'll notarize it and never saw anybody sign. Yeah. And so your will's basically worthless. All that money you spent is, is no good. Yeah. I, I even had one person come in. They had signed the will. There were no witnesses, no notary, no nothing. They thought it was all optional. Uh, that's what I, I, I was just going to say that if you hadn't brought it up, because I remember you saying that story. And I, th- I was thinking, like, see, this is a problem when you don't know what you don't know. And then you might think you had it under control. And it's not the moment you get a do-over. Yeah, it has, it's like one of those. They talk about that with like the Secret Service. Well, you know, they have to be one hundred percent right all the time. Well, this is not like you can right because the person's deceased. Yeah, so you, you can't, can't get back. them to sign new documents. No. Wow. <laughs> or at, or you know they may have uh, dementia and yeah. and don't have capacity to sign anything. Wow. Yeah. All, all these different considerations, and I guess a question would be, what age do you? I mean. People, I think anytime you get in and do this is good, but when do you talk to people like, you know, you should really be thinking about this, what, in your 30s? In your, I mean, what would you say to... I would even say in their 20s if they have kids. You know, oh, wow. if you have yeah. kids, that changes everything. You yeah, really yeah. need to have all this in place. And most of us walk around, we don't even know that we're in this danger, right? Because we, you got to, you know, in the will, you also nominate who you want as the guardian of oh, your yeah. kids. If they're minors, who's going to take custody, you know. Um, so there are a lot of other considerations. How, how are we going to handle the money? When are they going to get the money? Uh, that kind of thing. So that's actually a good question. So let's suppose we sit down and we do we do a trust and we get everything organized like that. Do I still need a will? Yes. You always have a will with a trust. It's called a pour-over will. Okay. And the will simply says, I leave everything to my trust. Okay. And it's there in case we forget to put an asset in the trust. Or like maybe you got something after all the paperwork was done. Well, and let's back. use our example. Somebody does a trust. They put all their assets in the trust because uh-huh. you have to fund the trust. You have to put them in it. Right. And that requires you physically putting them in the name of the trust. Mm-hmm. But we have that you know, $3,000 bank account that we forgot. Well, you would have to probate that. Wow. But it would end up going into the trust as well. Right. But if you had that, what you called a pour over will, then that ought we already solved that problem because it would just dump in there and it doesn't have to go through all that. You would still have to go through probate because all wills go through probate. And oh, that, oh, and that oh. asset has to go through probate to get to the trust. Okay. But in it, but eventually then it would be, yeah. Wind up in there. So that's another question. So that- hopefully, you know, if you've done a trust and it's funded properly, we, we've we really made your will meaningless because there's not going to be any assets that have to go through probate. Right. So I want to reserve time because we've got to talk about the car raffle. But I do have one more question about, uh, about this that you, that you made me think about. Like if we put everything into um, a trust, 
does that solve squabbling that comes up later, like all these, like the Aretha Franklin story about wills being found later or things like that? <sighs> Not necessarily. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it all depends on the circumstances of when, how and when all the documents were signed. Is there any undue influence, coercion, duress? Did the person lack capacity? You know, uh, you can get somebody with Alzheimer's to sign about anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, you know, absent those kinds of things, uh, yeah, usually it's going to stand up. Okay. Okay. Well, so we've been talking with uh, board certified elder law attorney Bill Johnson. The law office is William A. Johnson, PA. Um, we already talked about if you go to FloridaElderLaw.net, you can download a copy of the long term. I think it's what it's called, right? The long the Florida Long Term Care Nursing Home and Answer Book. This is a great book. Let me tell you, it's one of the first things I read when I met Bill all those years back when Joe got us introduced because it was so well written you don't have to be like a lawyer or like a legal scholar to understand it he's broken it down in easy english and it really is helpful plus you do a lot of seminars where people can come and learn for free and it's probably a good way to kind of like figure out what i need to do as my next step how, how do we find i know you do these at one senior place how do we find out about all these uh, you can call one senior place so they uh -huh. they uh, publish a schedule okay and then or you can just call my office at 321-253-1667 okay. and they can tell you when the next one is and another good reason to call bill's office is because he has tickets and we're talking about helping seniors car raffle tickets and that's our fundraiser and i'm going to kind of pivot and talk about that for a minute because on sunday october 27th we are going to be at the American Muscle Car Museum once again because we want to find out if you win the, actually this is the 8th annual, Bill, 8th annual Helping Seniors Car Raffle. We're calling it Choose Your Adventure because there's a great variety of cars in this. There's literally uh, seven cars. <clears throat> so you can choose everything from like a Chevy Color Colorado pick -em up truck to a Jeep Compass Sport. There's a little sporty Dodge Hornet in there. There's a, uh, like our winner picked last year, the Mitsubishi Outlander. It's a neat little uh, SUV. There's a Mazda sedan, the Mazda 3. There's a, a sporty little Mazda Miata in there. There's a Kia Sportage. I mean, there's, there's literally seven cars you can pick from. And when we pull your winning ticket that day, you're going to tell us which car you want to go home in. So it's going to be that much fun. And you don't have to be present to win at the American Muscle Car Museum. But if you're in town, this is one of those opportunities you get to go in and peek at Mark's collection because really the only time you can do that is when he's got it open for a um, charitable event. It's basically, otherwise, it's his private garage. He's just generous enough to allow us to come and have our grand drawing there. And now, Bill, even if you were there last year, he's close to 500 cars. He just keeps adding cars. I think the first year we did this, he had like 250 cars. And so what we've noticed every year we go back, the cars get closer together because he's got to park more of them in there. Then he's got double stacks now, and now they're talking about going to triple and four stacks. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You've been there. Yeah, I've been there, and I've noticed that too. It's, <laughs> it's like every every ounce of space is being used. Yeah, but the, here's the other thing, though. We had so many people come out last year that we, we actually, I think, broke every attendance record that they had ever seen. And so what we said is this year, we want to make sure that we're keeping it comfortable for everybody, which is why we decided to go for a daylight event. So that makes it easy to get to the museum in daylight hours, but it also makes it easy to get to your car back, get your car and get out it, you know, cause it'll all be daylight on both sides. So that's one. Number two is because it's daylight, we can do stuff in the museum, but we can also do stuff outside the museum so we're planning a whole thing called the choose your adventure village where you'll be able to see cars great adventures here in brevard county there's gonna be food trucks out there's gonna be all kinds of fun outside as well as mark's incredible collection inside and because it's a daylight hours event we're making it kid friendly so what we're asking folks and especially because it's last weekend before halloween trunk or treat and all that kind of stuff so we're saying like every time you get a ticket you can bring Two kids, it's supposed to be 10 and under, but I don't think there is like age identification police there. But you're allowed to bring two kids with you and then you can have just a great 
you know, grandkids afternoon out and maybe you're going to go home in a new car. We'll see. But you got to get a ticket. One ticket is $25. Five is $100. You're really supporting the work of helping seniors. And I always tell people, like, this is like half of our budget for the year. If we don't do well with this, we can't do all the things that we really do need to do for seniors here. So we really do need and 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 ask for your help. Joe came up with this idea of raffling off cars because he said, Carrie, you know, fundraising, you know, you're basically begging for money all the time. Uh, and you have to. If you're not willing to do that, your charity isn't going to stay around very long. But he said, I wanted to find a fun way to do it, you know. And the car raffle is a great way. A.J. Hires puts up these great cars. Mark Pylock opens up his beautiful museum. And it just makes it a fun way to keep the work of helping seniors go. For- do you have a favorite car in this year's uh, raffle yet, Bill? Well, give me my choices. <laughs> Chevrolet, Colorado pickup truck, Jeep Compass Sport, Mazda Miata. We've got the uh, the the SUVs. You've got the Kia Sportage and the Mitsubishi Outlander. You've got the little sporty Dodge Hornet, and you've got the um, who am I leaving? Oh, the Mazda three, which is just a little nice sedan. Probably the Outlander. That is going to be a fun fun one. We gave away the Outlander, as you may mm. remember, last year. Diane Pilak. Uh, chose that. Now, two years before, we had given away the Kia Sportage because there was a guy, David Odahowski, who, uh, who he wanted that. That was his pick. So it's going to be fun to see what folks pick this year. And what a great opportunity. And we're planning so much, so much fun that's going to be there. So how do you get a ticket? So we started this by saying you can go by Bill's office. You can come by, we call it Joe's Senior Resource Center. It's that beautiful space they donated for us in the Omni Healthcare Building, downtown Melbourne, 1344, South Apollo Drive, second floor. Karen will be happy to get you going with tickets there. You can call us for tickets at 321-473-7770. You can pick them up online, helping com, or you can pop by any of the Boniface Hires dealerships. That would help you decide which car you want to pick when you win, but you could also pick up your tickets while you're there. Bill, it's just going to be a fun Sunday afternoon then. It will. It most definitely will. It's always a good time. Yep. And so uh, on behalf of uh, our entire team for the Helping Seniors Group, uh, Bill, thank you for always being generous with your time and helping to teach us the things we need to learn about this show on probate. I, again, every time I sit with you, I learn new things. So I really, uh, really enjoyed it. And that's why we do this, because our, our uh, mission is to educate, inform, and connect seniors to their resources. And so we are so glad that you tuned in, and we're so looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday right back here on 90.3 FM WEJF. Have a great week from here to there.